Okay, so we are recording. Um, this was supposed to be a live conversation, uh, but due to technical difficulties, we are recording and we will be uh, posting this on our social media and website later on. Um, so my name is Kim Bolero. I'm the Hero Center Director at Voices of Hope. Uh, my, uh, my position is to work with students and educators um, to, help, uh, to help the community get a deeper understanding of the Holocaust and, and make it a very relevant and personal uh, history. So I am, I am here with uh, Anne Bukar. I'm sorry for my French pronunciation. Uh, Anne is uh, a wonderful volunteer at the Hero Center. She has worked with us uh, as a museum docent and she has been speaking in schools as well uh, about her family history. Um, and uh, it's, it's such a wonderful thing to have to have you here uh, speaking with me today, Anne. It really is, so thank you. Um, and I also want to introduce uh, Anne's mother, you can uh, you can see the resemblance. Uh, this is Anne's mother calling in from Brussels, Belgium. This is Sarah, and uh, I am so excited to finally meet you, um, even via Zoom. So th thank you so much for being here, Sarah. I really really appreciate your time. Um, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll a I'll ask you some questions and, you know, we can have a little conversation, but I wanted to give you both time to talk about your experience and, uh, and the point of this series, the local heroes series, um, is because Anne has become one of our local heroes and, uh, we're so proud of the work that she does with us. So, um, so the first thing, Anne, maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. So, um, I come from, uh, Brussels and, uh, I was born and raised over there. Um, grew up with my mom and dad and, uh, and our dog. <laughs> And um, I, um, I had, you know, pretty much a normal childhood. Um, and uh, in 1984 or 83, I met um, um, the father of my children. And I came to America in 84. And, um, you know, then I... Just um, stay here. I live in Simsbury. Very good. Okay. Um, and so maybe you can um, tell us maybe why and how did you get involved with Voices of Hope and, and the Hero Center? Um, because I'm, um, I'm the, um, my mother is a Holocaust survivor. She was a hidden child in uh, Belgium. And my grandparents were um, fi uh, resistant, uh, Belgian resistant. And I feel very strong about my uh, background and where I come from. And I feel very strong about the heroism of my grandparents. And, um, and I feel very strong about my mother's um, strength and, um, I forgot that word, uh, When you survive something, her, um, I forgot that word. Um, and that um, I'm very uh, impressed with uh, the Voices of Hope and the Hero Center and their commitment to education. And that's really what I'm about. So um, this is why I decided to join the group and, um, and also to feel a group where I belong because a lot of the um, other people there have what I, I learned recently from a, a book um, that there is such a thing as the uh, Holocaust gene. And um, I feel, feel very strongly that a lot of people in the group have it, like me. And um, I really want the kids to know 
the American kids to know the, my history, my family history. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Um, so from what I learned from working with you, um, I understand that your great grandparents originally came from Poland before moving to Belgium, correct? Grandparents. Right. Okay. And, and your grandparents met in Brussels. Belgium. In, yes. in, in Brussels. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. So we have the family, both families separately moving from different parts of Poland to. to well, Belgium. my great grandparents never left Poland. Oh, okay. Um, my paternal great grandfather was killed in the pogrom, mm -hmm. and uh, his wife and his. Um, his wife and his daughter died a year later. So my grandfather was alone and my grandmother left Poland on her own, well, with her sister with a uh, legal um, visa. But okay. the great grandparents stayed and died in Poland. Okay, all right, okay, thank you. Um, so then maybe, uh, maybe Anne and Sarah, you can both Tell us a little bit about your experience in, in Belgium um, once, the, once the Nazis come to power in Europe and, and their movement into, into Belgium. Um, I'll let you both kind of tell the story. Um, and so I'll, I'll let you speak about that. Okay, so you wanted to hear, um, say it again from so maybe, uh, so when Sarah first recognized that the Nazis had, had moved into Belgium, um, maybe what happened from then? Okay. Tu veux le dire en français, alors je traduis? Oui. Okay, uh, she's going to say uh, French. Uh, uh, le 10 mai 1940, uh, l'Allemagne a envahi la Belgique. May 10, 1940, the Germany invaded Belgium. Au début, il euh, n'y avait pas de problème. Enfin, At the beginning, it was okay. Alors, en, ça a commencé en 1942. En 1942, euh, les Juifs ne pouvaient plus sortir après 8 heures. After 1942, the Jews could not get out of the house after 8, 8 o'clock p.m. Les enfants ne pouvaient plus aller à l'école. Children go to go to school anymore. Et euh, les magasins juifs, euh, ça allait, mais c'était pas fameux. Enfin, euh, enfin, ça, non, ça, on laisse tomber. Donc, euh, euh, couvre-feu, les enfants qui ne vont plus à l'école, il euh, n'y avait plus beaucoup de travail. There was not a lot of work for Jews. Euh, sauf, évidemment, si on travaillait pour les Allemands. Unless they worked for the Germans. Euh, mon père et euh, Jacques Copperblum, qu'on a vu avec euh, mes parents, n'ont jamais voulu le faire. Uh, my, my grandfather, and then, um, maybe you can show the picture of the people walking in the streets. Oh, I have that picture. Uh, so my grandfather and, oh, where's the picture? picture with the people walking in the street. Right, so I can, um, I think I can try and share this. Hold on, let me see if this will come up. Oh uh, yeah, okay. So let me, share my screen here. Um, we have some photos from, uh, from Anne's uh, presentation with students. So we have this here. Yeah. Okay, so the guy on the left. So him and my so grandfather. 
No. Uh-uh. Okay, other, yes. Yeah, and my father. Yeah. This is your father here? Yeah. Okay. And this is you? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So they did not want to work for the Germans. Dans la rue, il y avait un couple juif avec une petite fille. Euh, lui, il, il a travaillé pour eux. In the streets, there was a couple with a little girl, and he, he, he worked for the German. Il faisait des, des vestes en fourrure oh, he did pour ceux qui partaient au front de l'Est. For the one who were going to the East um, Front. Mm -hmm. Euh, les premières euh, arrestations ont commencé en 1942 et le 26 mai 1942, ma mère avait rendez-vous avec euh, quelqu'un de la résistance. Elle a été dénoncée et oh, elle a été arrêtée. Uh, à la bourse à Bruxelles. In 1942, they started to do the, um, they started to uh, round up the Jews, and on uh, May 9, uh, 26, 1942, so two days after my mother's 11th birthday, um, her mother had an appointment with um, someone in the resistance, and she was betrayed and uh, was, um, was arrested then. Uh, à la bourse, which is um, which used to be a big building with the finance district, like. Donc, ils sont venus à la maison. They came to the house. Il y avait un gestapiste et un SS. There was a Gestapo man and an SS. Et ils sont repartis une demi-heure après, donc à 6 heures et à 6 heures et demie. Ils sont repartis avec ma mère et mon père. And uh, after a half hour, they left with um, her mother and father. And she, at 11, she was left alone in the apartment. Mm. Mon père est revenu à 9h. Parce que uh, la dénonciation était contre ma mère. Her father came back at 9 o'clock because the... The denunciation, denunciation was about my grandmother. Donc à ce moment-là, mon père m'a dit que euh, je, il fallait que qu'il me qu me place et il euh, parce qu'il allait jusqu'à présent, il faisait de la résistance. Euh, disons, en, pour les journaux, la presse clandestine, collecter de l'argent et des bons de ravitaillement pour la résistance, mais qu'à partir de ce moment-là, il allait entrer dans les partisans armés. So when he came back, he said, well, I'm going to have to place you to a safe place because right now I'm doing work for um, the... The, uh, for the newspaper and the, and, um, the, the bon ravitaillement, uh, the, the, the voucher for food and the money, but now I'm going to go into the arms resistant and that's more dangerous. Mm -hmm. Donc, à ce moment-là, il s'est adressé euh, au groupe de Madame André Ida Sterno, Yvonne Jospa, euh, il y avait encore d'autres. Et j'ai été, euh, et on m'a mis à ce moment-là dans un couvent près de Mons. So then he contacted the group that was called uh, le, le, comment ça s'appelait encore le groupe de Madame André? Uh, uh. Je ne sais plus. Je ne sais plus. Enfin, il y avait un groupe avec Mme André, Ida Sterno. In charge with the children. Voilà, in charge of the children, as little as infant, all the way to 18 years old. And uh, then um, she was sent to a convent near Mons, which is south-east uh, south of uh, Brussels. 
Okay, just just so our viewers will know, um, this is a photo here of Madame Mandre. Um, she is the woman who uh, who hid Sarah um, uh, as a Jewish child. Uh, yeah. Her at, at uh, Anne, you said she was twenty years old here. Yeah. Yeah. She was a, uh, she was a school teacher. Is that? Yeah. Okay. So she was a member of the of the resistance and was hiding. In charge, yes, with the children. Okay, all right. After that, uh, I was in, uh, j'ai été dans les Ardennes. She went in the Ardennes, which is um, um, south uh, east, bordering with France and Luxembourg in Germany. Près mm d'Arlon. -hmm. Uh, Near Arlon, yeah. Dans un château de presse de ligne. It was in a castle. Là, je suis resté euh, trois semaines, mais je sentais que si je, je voulais revoir mon père. She stayed there for three weeks, but she wanted to see her father again. Donc, je suis à force, je suis revenu à Bruxelles. Je suis resté grosso modo un mois avec mon père. She mois. went back and stayed with her father maybe like about a month. Et après donc il m'a conduit euh, à la gare de Luxembourg où madame, où madame André nous attendait et nous sommes partis dans les Ardennes à Sugny qui est vraiment au, au bord de la forêt des Ardennes. So then, uh, after a month from staying with her father, he took her again to Madame André, and then they went to Sunni, uh, another place in the uh, in the Ardennes. Donc c'est une forêt qui, qui couvre une, uh, la Belgique et la France. It's Donc, woods that cover France and Belgium. Donc, euh, on était là et on a passé euh, plusieurs mois jusqu'au jour où euh, il y a une monitrice qui, euh, entre-temps, oui, d'abord, il y a eu une monitrice qui m'a appelé euh, et qui m'a dit que je ne m'appelais pas Janine Van Meerag, donc mon faux nom, mais que je m'appelais Sarah Lamour. Elle, a, elle avait des photos de moi. Euh, par la suite, j'ai appris que mon père avait été arrêté en juillet 43. Ok, attends, je vais... Euh, donc, oui. euh, she was in the, uh, in the convent, and then one day... Et, non, euh... ce n'était pas un couvent. Ah, pardon, pardon. Um, she, um, so, she was in Sunni. And then one day, um, a lady, like a counselor, like a camp counselor kind of person, um, took my mother on the side and uh, said that my mother was given um, a uh, Christian Catholic name, uh, Janine Van Meeragen, because Sarah Lamhart is uh, very Jewish. And uh, the woman um, find pictures that was left in my grandfather's wallet and we take it that as he was arrested in, in Brussels, they must have found the pictures. So they showed the pictures and they told my mother, we know where you are, you are not Janine Van Meerag and you are Sarah Lamad. Donc, euh, le directeur euh, l'a a, a renvoyé et elle et une autre et euh, Étant donné le danger, on nous a fait revenir sur Bruxelles. So, since the counselor couldn't get any words of my mother, um, she let her go, and then she, mom went right away to the director, and um, he fired uh, that woman and her, her friend, and because he was getting dangerous, they took my mother and her friends to another place. Okay. Donc, c'est à ce moment-là qu'on est arrivé à Wezembeek au couvent. 
That's when they arrived at the convent in Wiesenbeek of Bem, which is an outskirt of Brussels. Et là, on est resté jusqu'à la libération. Then they stayed there until liberation. So just so we, um, just for, for our viewers, um, it's wonderful to hear you translating the story and, and helping each other out. My, I, like I said, my French is non-existent, but I do understand pardon. Um, <laughs> so this is really lovely. Lovely. Um, and we have a couple of pictures um, from Anne's presentation that she normally does with students. Um, Sarah, this is you, correct? Yeah. Yes, uh, making your, your uh, Catholic communion. Um, yeah. Donc, on a été baptisé. On était, on était six. On a été baptisé. There were six of them, and they were baptized first. Wow. On, on a fait notre communion solennelle. They did the, I guess, first communion. Et euh, ça ne nous a pas, ça ne nous a pas dérangé. Mais de, toute fa... <laughs> Mais de toute façon, euh, le pape Jean XXIII euh, a dit que les enfants qui avaient été baptisés pendant la guerre, s'ils voulaient renoncer, euh, s'ils ne voulaient pas continuer à être catholiques, ils étaient libres de le faire. Ah, ok. Voilà. Donc, euh, lequel, lequel, pope, lequel pape, maman? Jean 23. Le pape euh, Jean 23 a uh, déclaré que um, les enfants juifs qui étaient baptisés et avaient communion pendant la guerre, um, It's okay if they want to go, like, don't want to stay uh, Christians. How kind of him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, Mais de toute uh, façon, je veux signaler que Jean 23 était nonce apostolique en Turquie et que pendant une nuit, il y a, il avait un bateau uh, style Exodus qui partait pour la Palestine et euh, il a réuni tout son euh, comment tout son personnel et ils ont passé la nuit à faire des certificats de baptême pour tous les enfants qui étaient sur le bateau. Ah ok, he uh, uh, John Paul uh, 23 helped the Jewish kids with uh, making uh, papers that I will show that all those children are, the, on the boat of Exodus, they was going to Palestine, mm -hmm. <coughs> pardon, um, that all the children were Christians to save their life. Okay. Wow, that's incredible. Um, and I think it's, it's really lovely that we have um, photos like this Uh, from your time in hiding, Sarah, um, they're, they are really, some of them are, are really remarkable and they're, they are, I love this photo. I think it's so beautiful. Um, so we have some pictures of, of life in the convent um, here, a, a playground and then also the school yeah. room. Um, how did you get these photos? Where did... Where did I, had a, I had a lot, uh, mais quand on est allé visiter le musée de l'Holocauste, on a vu des photos que je n'avais pas. On est allé aux archives et là, ils m'ont fait des copies des photos que je n'avais pas. Yeah, so these pictures, like the picture in the classroom and the picture in the playground, uh, where... Um, cette photo si je l'avais. Ah, c'est là tu l'avais. Ah bon. This one we had. And then, I don't know if you can show, this is my mom. I don't know if me showing her. Um, actually, the picture with the classroom. Can you show? Non, ça on a fait. Et l'autre de moi aussi. So the other one, uh, One was very uh, interesting. One day, mom and I we went to the uh, Holocaust Museum, and uh, we went to see um, 
they were then the, um, computers with screens and one on top of it, there was a sign say hidden children. And there was a sign on the, on the picture saying, uh, we have some pictures that we don't know who they belong to, please help us. And then mom like just got really uh, surprised to see the picture of the playground. And uh, then we uh, had the archive to identify the people and where it was in the year and so on. Wow, that is, that's incredible. Um, and we, we hear about this, so we've heard about this with some of our local survivors as well that happen to just see themselves in, in pictures put out by, by various museums. It's, it's really remarkable um, what, was, what was captured um, in, in photos at this time. Um, so uh, one, one, maybe one more question for, for Sarah um, about having to change your identity at such a young age and um what was that experience what was that experience like for you il n'y a pas eu de problème parce que euh, j'avais des parents euh, qui ne m'ont jamais rien caché M mes parents m'ont toujours tout expliqué et je savais ils m'ont dit voilà on fait de la résistance, mais le jour où on est arrêté, eh bien, ce sera fini. Donc, euh, je ne vais pas dire que j'avais une conscience politique, j'étais trop jeune, mais je comprenais. So it wasn't so bad for, um, for mom, because since she was little, uh, well, actually, since the war started, uh, she always knew her parents never hid anything from her. Um, she recalls um, having um, going to bed and hearing noise and there were meetings with resistance in the living room. So she knew what was going on. And um, uh, her parents always said that this is what we're doing. And if we ever get caught, then that would be the end of us. So she was aware of what was going on. And also the fact that her parents will hide newspaper under her coat. You know, they made her winter coat with pockets inside and hide the newspaper inside. Donc, euh, c'était plus facile pour moi que pour les autres qui ne, qui qui ne savaient rien. It was easier for her than the other kids who didn't know anything about it. Donc, uh, voilà. Yeah. Um, and just to, to finish up there, uh, today, May 8th, is the 75th anniversary of Victory in Europe Day. This is the day the Germans uh, surrendered unconditionally. Um, you mentioned that, um, Sarah, you were in hiding until liberation. What did liberation look like for you? How did you find out that you were free? Ça a été plus dur pour moi après parce que tous les jours j'allais à la gare où revenaient les prisonniers et de guerre et des camps. So it was et... harder for her after because after the war every day she will go to the station and look for people coming back from the war or from the concentration camps. Mm. Donc, et alors je suis allé à la Croix-Rouge. J'ai euh, rencontré des gens qui avaient été dans les camps. Alors je demandais des nouvelles de mes parents parce que à ce moment-là, on ne savait pas encore nous, le peuple. On ne savait pas encore ce qu'avait été Auschwitz et les autres camps. Donc, je ne savais pas. Je pensais que probablement je pourrais retrouver ou les deux, ou l'un, ou l'autre. Uh, OK. So, she uh, went to the Red Cross and um, she went to the Red Cross and she met people that um, knew her parents and maybe find out what it was. But um, at that time, 
they were not, she was not aware of Auschwitz yet. She didn't know what it was. So she was still hoping that maybe they will come back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear that. And, um, and when did you find out what, what happened to, to your parents? Uh, tout doucement. Bon. Et puis alors, on a su. Donc, après, j'ai su que ma mère était partie par le 21e, le 16e convoi en octobre 42. So then she find out that her mother left for the, uh, quel numéro? 16. Le 16th convoy in October 1942. Et mon père par le convoi 21 en juillet 43. And her father was the convoy 21 in July 43. Mm -hmm. Et du convoi 21, il n'y a eu aucun survivant. And from Convoy 21, there was no survivors. <coughs> well, I'm very sorry to hear that. And, and thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Um, so maybe for Anne, what, what drove you to learn more about your family history? And, and what, what has that experience been like learning about uh, learning about this history and, and sharing it with people. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, the, the thing that came up for me as a kid is that um, why do I only have one set of grandparents um, since a lot of my, uh, the other kids in the classroom had two sets. So um, I just remember Little by little, like my mother telling me little story. Um, I, um, I understand now, having children on my own, that her not telling me a lot was a way to protecting me. And to go from a right? Tu m'arrêtes, si c'est pas bien, quoi. So, yeah, it was her way to protect me for not telling me a lot. Um, and then slowly I, um, I discover, you know, that I'm a Jew with um, hanging out with the Jewish girlfriends in school, like Pat Martin uh, Stravinsky and Patricia Pom. They were uh, Jewish girls. And um, then um, I was curious, so I joined the Jewish Center in Brussels, and then I really start to learn more and um, ask more. Then one day, my mom took me uh, to a commemoration at the, at the monument in Brussels, and then little by little like that, I learned on my own. And... Um, Et les réunions d'enfants cachés. And the meeting of the, yeah, the meeting of uh, hidden children uh, in Brussels. Um, and um, yeah, that's how I, you know, discovered my identity. Then I went to, I joined the Jewish Center. I took Hebrew class. I went to Israel and there I was. <laughs> so it's, it's an ongoing uh, learning experience. Uh, this is, I mean, it's an ongoing learning experience for, for anyone who is, who is interested in, in this history. Um, and so you mentioned I, identity. Um, and so you developed an activity for, for students around this theme of identity and what it means to be an individual. And um, I'm wondering, uh, why did you why did you think that was an, an important activity to, to develop? And, you know, what, what do you see when you have, when you do this with students? What is the outcome that you see with them? Um, well, I do it because having my own identity as a teenager was really hard. Um, you know, discovering coming from a non-Jewish father, um, atheist, so he didn't believe in anything. Um, we didn't have a lot of holidays. I remember a little Christmas tree uh, on the, on the, um, a little one, a fake one on the, um, on the mantle of the fake fire, 
place. And um, in Europe, we exchange gift on the 1st of um, um, January. We call that Les le Etrennes. Mm -hmm. And um, so I really struggled with knowing who I was. Uh, you know, one day I was dressed as a hippie, another day I was preppy, a third day, you know, I didn't really know. So identity is something that, um, knowing my identity is something that came um, much later in life. Um, even as a, you know, married, I came to America and um, I had a, a very over controlling, you know, mother-in-law that um, not knowing who I was, I kind of like grasp on her and, mm. and that's because it was all part of my journey of finding who I was. And, um, and now I want to help children who, who are in the same age, around teenager, middle school, high school, to uh, have a maybe a earlier on life a better grasp at who they are. Mm, absolutely. And I think, I think that's a very common thing for young people to, uh, to struggle with. And I think it, in watching you do this activity with students, it gives them a chance to really reflect on themselves and, and we encourage them to, to really look in, inside and you know, what are things that, that make them happy and what are things about themselves that, that make them feel confident or, or, or true to themselves. And so it's, yes. it's wonderful to, to see them interact when they do this activity. Um, and then tying it into your mother's story in that she had to completely deny who she was to survive. And uh, it, it really puts things in perspective, I think, for, for students. Um, so, so to kind of close the conversation out, maybe both Sarah and Anne, you can answer this. Um, we're in a very strange time. Um, I'm in West Hartford, Anne, you're in Simsbury. Sarah, you're in Brussels, and we're all in lockdown at home. Um, so maybe, Sarah, what can you, what advice can you give us for those who are struggling with, um, with isolation or um, finding, uh, finding ourselves in difficult times and what, what is something that, that helps you stay hopeful? First of all, uh, tout d'abord, je voudrais dire, maintenant, je réalise que quand on, est, quand on vient au monde comme juif, on reste juif. Now I realize that when you come in this world as a Jew, you stay a Jew. Même si on ne suit pas la religion, parce que mes parents ne suivaient pas la religion, mais c'est une façon de penser, c'est une façon d'être, c'est la générosité, le partage, l'amitié, Et l'argent n'est pas le principal. Uh, ok, wow. Um, uh, that it's... Um, Take your time. Yeah, it's really, it's very strong. It's beautiful. I... Um, I... Um, I can't really translate that. It's just too, it's really good. It's, it's beautiful <laughs> that it's all about, you know, um, that, you know, being a Jew is about, uh, it doesn't matter if you practice or not. Uh, my, uh, grandparents, my grandparents came from Orthodox family, but they didn't practice once they were in Belgium. Mm -hmm. um, it's about, you know, gener generosity, uh, kindness, um, gen being yeah. general, friendship, 
friendship and uh, that all that, that like money doesn't matter that you know with everything that's going on yeah Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and so, Anne, do you have any, <laughs> um, anything that, that maybe you've learned from, from your research and from learning about this with your mother together? Is there, um, is there any maybe message that you think the next generations should hold on to? Um, so what I'm, what I'm getting with this whole confinement is that, um, I, uh, I'm, I'm more aware now of um, the strength that my mother gives me, the strength that she, that she has, the, the, what she went, resilience, that's the word I was looking for earlier, mm -hmm. her resilience, her strength, um, and uh, to really work on this time, because I don't have a lot to do. I'm not, I don't have my children here. Uh, I don't have to to be to take care of something or someone. Um, so really working on my journey, being more aware of a lot of things in life. And um, you know, I like mom's uh, what she says that uh, in all of this, money doesn't matter. You know, and um, that's a big. I think that's a big message for a lot of people. A lot of people might think, yeah, yeah, but you know, things are this way and I don't have a job and all, but everything that my mother mentioned is way more important. Mm. You know, right. that's how I see it, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, these these are very uncertain and, and kind of unprecedented times for, um, for at least my generation. Um, and uh, it's, uh, I mean, we're all hoping that when things slowly start opening up that, um, you know, the people who are, who are really struggling with this will, will get back on their feet. And as long as we come out of this with our health and, um, yeah, it was our health. Yeah. I, I think that'll be the most important because, uh, we'll be able to see our families again and we can hug our families again. And, um, I, I, I have a new niece. She was born less than two weeks ago and I, I won't be able to hold her until it's safe again. And uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult. Um, but I think, I think remaining hopeful and, mm -hmm. and um, trying to stay as positive as possible and safe and healthy and protecting yourself and your family and the people around you is really important. Yeah, and and you know the, the the strength from Holocaust survivor is is unbelievable. Watching on the news, the number of I don't know how big the number is, but there's quite a few Holocaust survivor who had the virus and lived through the virus too. It's just it shows the strength of my mother's generation uh, to to the will to survive, and those people for me are the best example. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think one of one of the many gifts of working in this in this field is that because we work with so many survivors and we study a lot of very difficult photos and videos and history, um, it really keeps things in perspective almost all the time. Um, so even when we are having a really difficult time with the everyday um, problems that we might have. I know in, in my, in the back of my head, I'm thinking of your mother and I'm thinking of our, our other uh, survivors in, in our community. And I think it's, it's really important for me to kind of pull from, from their experience. Um, and so I'm, I'm so happy that we were able to, to all speak today. Um, so just, just to conclude, I wanted to, to thank my, my guests, <laughs> Anne and Sarah. It's been such an honor speaking with both of you and, um, thank you for your patience and for your generosity. And, um, I hope very much to see you again, Anne, soon. And I hope very much that I can travel to, to Brussels. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, and and be able 
to, to meet you in person, Sarah. Um, thank you both so much and, uh, and be well and, and safe and healthy, okay? You too. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.